Hi, my name is Isabel Kreka, and I'm here to talk to you today about Clallam, an endangered language that is close to home here at Western and even closer to home to where I grew up on the Olympic Peninsula. In the 1990s, Clallam seemed to have a grim future. However, today it's found itself in an interesting position that casts a hopeful light on other revitalization work. But before I talk about Clallam, I want to talk a little bit about language shift, language, linguistic diversity, and how we measure linguistic vitality. So, language shift is happening all around us all the time, and that in itself is not necessarily a cause for concern. Pe pe people who speak one language will slowly but surely switch to another language for more and more purposes. However, what we're really seeing in the world today is more than just shift. It's widespread language loss, and it's leading us towards a glo global loss of linguistic diversity. Out of the estimated 7,000 languages in the world today, 40% are considered at least at risk, if not endangered or dying. I feel like when we think about a dead language, we think about something like Latin, something that was spoken far away, long ago, and that we still have some existing knowledge about. But language loss is happening here and now. And it's always accompanied by an irreversible loss of call culture and knowledge that is contained within every language. Here within North America, we have 175 indigenous languages. 125 of those are only spoken by the grand parental generation. 55 of those are only spoken by the very elderly. 20 are being naturally acquired by children. That means 155 out of 175 languages will probably disappear from, the America, from America without intervention. I guess we get a B plus, that's 88%. <laughs> if you look at the map behind me, it gets a little easier to visualize two, whoop, two of the main trends in where and why language endangerment is happening. You can see clusters through Southeast Asia and Indonesia, as well as Africa and South America, and each one of those is a language. The closer to red, the more in danger. You can't actually see them up there because they're very small, but there are a couple black ones, and that represents extinction. <coughs> so there are two things that we need to think about. All of these regions are high in biodiversity, which as Suzanne Romain posits, go hand in hand with linguistic diversity. They also share some history. They've all had extensive colonial presence. Colonial presence is important to take into account when we think about language loss because of the strong connection between language and power. If one language is associated with power, then it can be a force pulling or pushing speakers away from an indigenous language. The Olymp Olympic Peninsula fits right into both of those trends. It has three distinct linguistic families, or language families, Salishan, Waukeshan, and Chemakan before colonization. It also had a high degree of biodiversity due to geographic isolation while glacial ice was receding. And we've got 200 plus years of colonial presence and power dynamics. Here on the peninsula and around the world, we watch the same story unfold. Indigenous people, plants, and animals are all being pushed out by invasive species. This is true of languages as well. I like to think of English as the most invasive language. <laughs> In trying to rate a language's vitality or lack thereof, we are most concerned with the number of users and the range of uses that a language has, as well as how those numbers change across generations. Other factors are considered include age of users, how users are learning that language, and the proportion between first and second language users within a bilingual population. We also look at the amount of documentation there is of a language and the quality of that documentation. We use the EGIDS, the Expanded Graded Intergenerational Disruption Scale, to grade the level of endangerment. And if you're interested, Ethnologue can explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> what you need to know for this is that we characterize languages from a zero of being very healthy to a 10 of being extinct. Clallam would have fallen into an 8B or a 9, being nearly extinct or dormant. However, there is a category of language endangerment that doesn't quite fit into EGIDs. In 2008, Wesley Leonard proposed a different category for endangered languages that he called sleeping languages <coughs> to help address what was happening with the Miami, Illinois language in the Midwest. A sleeping language, according to Leonard's definition, is a language that has no remaining native speakers, 
but does have existing documentation and crucially still has cultural knowledge and is being claimed as a part of people's heritage. The last fluent speaker of Miami died in the 1960s and for 30 years it was truly a sleeping language. It's been in the process of awakening since the 1990s through teacher training and language revitalization projects enabled by linguist David Costa helping to reconstruct the syntax. Clallam was inches away, falling right into Leonard's category of sleeping after generations of shift and speaker loss. However, its revitalization work over the past 30 years has enabled Clallam to experience its own awakening without ever quite going to sleep. So, now that we've come back to Clallam, let's back up a little and fill some things in. Clallam is a part of the Salish and language family, either the coast or central branch depending on who you ask. It was originally spoken across the north coast of the Olympic Peninsula and the south shore of Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Today there are four Clallam communities, one in Beecher Bay, BC, and three in Washington. The Port Gamble Clallam, the Jamestown Clallam, and the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe. These are located in Port Gamble, Squim, and Port Angeles, or near, respectively. I focused on the Washington tribes for this project because attitudes and policy change with borders well, based on your government and the socio norms. Um, and crossing borders would have been too much for this paper. <laughs> <laughs> I was also particularly interested in the Washington tribes because they're so close to where I grew up. I grew up in Port Townsend, which is a 45 minute or less drive to each of these communities. And I am moderately ashamed of how unaware I was. I had no idea that these communities were here and struggling and that the language was doing anything, that there even was a Clallam language. Clallam County is the next one over, but I hadn't thought of it. Um, many factors have played into the shift towards English from Clallam as acceptable domains for its use rapidly shrank. Schooling policies designed for language and cultural erasure and growing negative sentiments between native and fishing communities over the regulations and conditions that led up to the Bolt decision were some of the biggest contributing factors. Around 1950, which was before the Bolt decision, there were maybe 200 speakers total. And by the 90s, there were 10 left in a community of about 1,000. There was a little existing documentation, including some old recordings and field notes, a partial dictionary, and a brief grammatical sketch which included a small set of language lessons. There was no standardized orthography, so matching those things up can get a little tricky. <laughs> In 1991, as indigenous heritage activities like the Paddle to Seattle came into the national awareness, the Lower Elwha tribe, in conjunction with linguist Timothy Motler, the Olympic National Park anthropologist J.C. Lee Ray, and Jamie Valadez, the cultural director and of the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe and now Clallam teacher. Uh, they started the Clallam language program. This program's ultimate goal was working towards a language revitalization through teaching the language, but initially they wanted to focus on documentation through creating a standardized alphabet, dictionary, and grammar, and then through exposure to the language through use in speeches, songs, and ceremonies within the tribes. I think they were much more successful than they anticipated. Um, although while the project was underway, the remaining native speakers were dwindling. Uh, we actually had the last native speaker pass away in 2014. So by most definitions, it should be a dead language. Uh, but instead, it's got teaching materials developed, uh, as well as certification standards for teaching indigenous languages within Washington state. Classes have been held at tribal centers for all three Clallam groups and the Port Angeles Public Schools from pre-kindergarten to high school. According to Jamie Valadez, from 1999 to today, over 700 students have completed coursework in Clallam through the Port Angeles School District. Although it is a long way from full revitalization, hundreds of people have been educated in Clallam who would have had little to no exposure. And the community as a whole is more culturally aware. Hopefully, this will give young Clallam people more pride in their language and their heritage and counteract some of the generations of shame. The program began just in time by starting while there were still remaining speakers, and the language never truly went to sleep. Between the Clallam language program and other projects underway to help increase Clallam visibility, I think that the language is experiencing an awakening. Thank you.
Yeah. And like three grand gets all the new language. That's oh, so awesome. Any <laughs> questions? Yeah. Can you talk a more about um, the members of these communities and what it's like for them to learn there? Like, like what, what, it, what the language means to them and why um, so many people want to learn it? Do you know? I mean, I can't say, speak for their experience. However, I would argue that there's a really important connection between language and culture and feeling connected to that culture. If you're isolated from your language and nobody around you is using it and the stories and the songs are no longer being spoken in that language, that it's a lot harder to really feel connected. And that has had really negative effects on Native American populations um, through the cloud. I don't know how much credit the Cloud Language Program can really take, um, but students who have participated have actually shown increased standardized test scores, um, which we can attribute to a more beneficial mental health and more dedication to their schooling because their schooling is speaking to their culture. Yeah. What age range are they targeting for teaching this, or what grade level in school? Everything from pre-kindergarten to high school. So. Pre-K, elementary school, middle school, you have some basic instruction and cultural education. And then in the high school, they actually are offering a full curriculum for three years of different difficulty levels. Yeah, Salvador? Um, is the education only taking place inside of schools or language nests, or are they encouraging parents to teach their children at the homes, inside the homes? I think the eventual hope is as we have the children who are learning this language now as young people in a way that it will stick with them. As they grow into adults, then there will be more ability to use it within the home. There are adult education classes happening within Clallam, but once you pass the critical period, it's just so much harder to retain a native-like speech. So the hope is that as these kids grow up, they'll be able to have Clallam in the home for new generations, and that that will help recreate a population of L1 users. Yeah. Isn't the question more about um, language engagement in general? Um, what would you say to somebody who is aspiring to be a teacher of English to speak as other languages who doesn't want to encourage any kind of language endangerment? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say encouraging that still that sense of cultural connection to your language and pride in your language, encouraging students to use their native language in as many domains and for as many functions as possible um, so that they aren't losing the language and that new speakers continue to see it functioning within their community. Um, I totally understand the draw to learning English. It's a necessary thing for so many people around the world. But if we can still encourage people to hold on to their language because of the connection it has to culture, hopefully. We can keep some more preservation. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.